All right, now in chapter 14 here, we're picking up with, with, the, um, <clears throat> with Paul and Barnabas. The, you know, remember in 13, they've been separated to the work. They've been called out to do something else. They were in Antioch, and they were called out to go and, and basically to, to, to preach the gospel and, and get churches started in these different locations. So they're called out to do this great work. And they run into a lot of persecution, and here we are. We're in, in chapter 14, verse number 1, and, and it says, And it came to pass in Iconium, this is where they're starting off in this chapter, that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. So they're, they're, they have this pattern of when they go into these new towns, they start off going into the synagogues of the Jews. That's kind of the place where, where it seems to make the most sense, I guess, where they walk in, they come into the synagogue, and then they're, gonna, they're, they're preaching Jesus Christ, essentially. And it says here in Iconium, a great multitude. I mean, it's a lot of people. A lot of people get saved. A lot of people put their faith on Christ from the preaching of Paul and Barnabas that they do. Look at verse number 2. It says, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. So notice, notice if, I mean, it's a kind of a common theme all throughout the book of Acts. I mean, you got these disciples, you got these men of God, they're going out and trying to do a great work. They're, they're motivated, they're, go, they're reaching people. I mean, they have miracles. People are getting, multitudes are getting saved. They're doing this great work, and they're constantly being met with resistance. And by and large, almost every single time without fail, it's the unbelieving Jews that are bringing this persecution against them. It's, it's, you don't find, you know, the unbelieving Gentiles are bringing the persecution against them. Now, are they involved in this, the Greeks, the Gentiles? I'm sure they are. But, but this is what's happening. It's starting with the unbelieving Jews. That's why it says in the end of verse 2, it says, they made, it's stirred up the Gentiles. So the Jews are, are, are in these, you know, in Iconium. The Jews that are in Iconium, Iconium is, is a land that's not a Jewish land, right? It's not, it's not like a land of Israel. They're going out. Into, into these other places, they're in Iconium, and it says they're stirring up the Gentiles. So now they're actually just stirring trouble against Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas are getting a lot of people saved. They're getting multitudes saved. They're doing a great work. The unbelieving Jews, they just can't stand the fact that this is going on. And, and they have so much bitterness and, and so much wickedness in their soul that they just can't stand the truth being preached, that they just have to stop their mouths and it says they made their minds evil affected against the brethren. So what they're probably doing is lying about them. Because he's saying they're making, you know, they're, they're, they're getting into these guys, into the Gentiles' heads. They're, they're talking to them, and they're basically putting Paul and Barnabas in a bad light. So however they might be doing it, they're making their minds evil affected against the brethren so that, so that they would, you know, hate them and just basically bring opposition. Now, the most opposition that you'll face, because I think it's interesting that it's the unbelieving Jews that are doing this. I mean, notice these people all have their own religion. You know, they go into these places, and we'll see later in the chapter, you know, they have the Roman gods that they, that, they, um, that they worship or that they believe in or whatever, all these different idols and all these other false gods and false religions that they have. But by and large, you don't see them just instantly just, just being against what they're preaching. <coughs> Normally, you see it, and they're, they're receiving it. A lot of people are receiving it. But it's the unbelieving Jews that are bringing the persecution that are, and that are stirring people up and, and, and tricking them and, just, and just, just saying, no, look, these guys are really bad. And they're swaying these crowds. They're swaying the Gentiles. They're swaying the Greeks into being against, the, um, against those that are saved, against people preaching about Christ. And it's, it's also interesting you know, that the most opposition that you're likely to face, at least here as a Christian today, is persecution from other Christians. You're going to get a lot of persecution. I mean, yes, there's, there's, there's persecution from other people, but like, if you think about it, the, the people who are, who are just adamant against you, you're going to have the God-haters for one. I mean, people just hate God. There's total reprobates. But oftentimes, you have people who, who claim Christianity at some level, and they're going to come. And, and you know, I'm not talking about say, you know, brethren. I'm not talking about people who are saved. I'm talking about people who claim Christianity. But usually it's like this really liberal Christianity that they just can't, they, they hate this, this teaching. And ultimately it is, it's going to be those that are the, the false prophets, as the Jews were false prophets. See, they were steeped in this religion, this false religion of Judaism that is really close 
to the true religion. I mean, they had Moses. They had the writings of Moses. They had God's word. But they were just completely, you know, um, not following it all, not believing it. Just as we have so many groups today, the Pentecostals, you know, Catholics, whatever, they have God's word, but they're not following it. And it's not everybody, but you're going to find that a lot of people, when you actually are living a Christian life and you're bringing the gospel and you're, and you're teaching this stuff, people get angry with you. And a lot of times you're going to get that from Christians, from other people, or people who claim to be Christians, people who claim to be in Christ, that persecution is, could, will oftentimes come from those types of people. But let's see how they respond to this persecution. Look at verse number three. Long time therefore, therefore means because of, because of these things that just happened, because of the unbelieving Jews stirring up the Gentiles, making their minds evil affected against the brethren, long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So because of all this persecution coming away, that's where they, they said they stayed there a long time. Because see, they're traveling around and going to different places. They say, okay, we're going to stay here and we're going to speak boldly. They didn't let, they didn't let that shut them up. They didn't, they didn't let the Jews that were stirring up these people and you got these rumors being spread. No, they just said, we're just going to speak more boldly. We're going to speak louder. And what God did, God blessed them for that. And he granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So he said, okay, you're going to speak boldly. You're going to preach my word. They're filled with the spirit because they're, they're preaching boldly. That God even, even um, magnified what they were saying by allowing them to do signs and wonders so that the people can not only hear what they were preaching, but they were able to see these great signs and wonders that were being done. And it's only possible because they had this boldness, because they were filled with the Spirit. Let's continue reading here in verse number 4. It says, But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. So we see here, you know, they're, they're convincing a lot of people. And, and the city is pretty much split. You know, a lot of people are saying, no, you know, what the apostle is saying is right. It's true. But then um, a lot of people were, were, were sticking with the Jews and, and not believing. And look at verse number five. It says, and when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also the Jews, with their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about. So here they catch wind of what's going to happen. These people are plotting to basically kill them. This is to use them despitefully. They hate them. They want, you know, they want to get rid of them and to stone them. And now they're getting the rulers involved. So you see here it says with the, um, it says both the, the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers. So they're, I mean, they're, they're getting, they're massing a lot of people together to bring harm to them. So when they hear about this, when they hear, hey, they're going to stone you, they say, okay, well, we're going to move on. So they move on to the next the next uh, region in Lycaonia, these cities of Lystra and Derby, and it says, and there they preach the gospel. So they just continue on and say, fine. They already abode there a long time. They already, you know, stirred up the people. They did a, they did a great work. They split the city in, in half, basically, with people sticking with them and, and people sticking with the Jews, and, and they got multitudes saved, so now they move on. And it says in verse number 8, and there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. So it says here, basically, his feet, he wasn't able to use his legs. He was a cripple. And it's not something that happened. It wasn't an accident that happened. It was from his mother's, from a child, from when he was born. He's never been able to walk. He's never been able to use his feet. The same heard Paul speak in verse 9, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. This is reminiscent of what we saw with Peter and John walking into the temple earlier in the book of Acts. And we see, and it, it, it's amazing how much, I mean, God, there's no accident for this. This happens on purpose. They, they put these in there, perceiving that he had faith to be healed. When you see these great miracles of healing, when you see these miracles being done, it's always linked and always associated with people having faith. And it's all a, an illustration for the greater picture that God is able to heal us. We have souls that are damned to hell. We have souls that, that are in this crippled position, if you will. We have, we have, we have souls that, that, are, that are diseased, that are sickly by sin. And 
if we have faith, God will heal us. God will heal our souls. God will heal our spirit and renew a spirit within us and, um, and, and you know, make our, our dead spirit to be born again and to become alive through faith in his name. And see, Paul sees this man, and first he sees that, hey, this guy has faith to be healed. And, and that's why it says, you know, Jesus was not able to do very many works, good works, in, um, in Nazareth, or, you know, where he came from. It says because, because there wasn't any faith, because people didn't believe. So he didn't do very many wonders. And you think, well, why wouldn't he do more there that would make people believe? But that's not the way God works. God sees, oh, you already have the faith. Now I'm going to do something big. Now I'm going to perform this miracle because you have the faith. But see, if, if you had to see something first as evidence, that's no longer faith. You don't need faith. It's already been proven to you already see this stuff. See, every time these men are getting healed, you know, you find it says, look, he had the faith to be healed. First comes the faith. First comes the recognition and believing, and then comes the, the, the big miracle, the big miraculous event. And that's what it was with this. I mean, this man was impotent from his mother's, basically from his mother's womb. He was never able to walk. Paul sees him, and he says with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet. And, that, and that's some boldness right there. I mean, he sees somebody, and he's able to perceive that, hey, this guy's got faith. He's got faith to be healed. And he just says to him, stand up right on your feet. The guy just gets right up, and he says he leaps and walks. He's able to leap up. Muscles that had never been used before become just perfect. Just, just come right as, as they, uh, strong enough to be able to leap up in the air. And we've covered this with the other miracles. It just Every time you see it, though, it's amazing. I mean, these are big events that happen. I mean, think about if you were that person. <laughs> That's going to be a big event in your life, and it's recorded here in the Bible for us to read. Um, God is powerful. And don't forget these stories. God is just as powerful today as he was back in the book of Acts. God is capable of healing. I don't care what your problem is. I don't care what your disease is. I don't care what your, your injuries are or whatever. God is capable of healing. God is capable of doing miracles. But we need to make sure that at the very least we have the faith. Put your faith in God. If you have faith to be healed, I believe that God is still able to do these things today. And they could, they could happen just as much today as they did back then. But we need to make sure that we have the faith to be healed. Let's continue reading in verse number uh, 11. It says, And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lycaonia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. So the people see this, and they're amazed, they're shocked. And, and for good reason. I mean, they knew this man. He was never able to walk. All of a sudden, Paul just tells them to stand up. And he's able to walk, so these guys are thinking, wow, the gods have come down. And of course, you know, they, they worshipped false gods. And that's what it says, and they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. So they're saying, you know, Barnabas is Jupiter, Paul's Mercury, you know, these fake Roman gods. Um, that's what they believe in those. So they're just thinking, hey, the gods have become men now, and they're able, that's the only thing that they could explain why they're able to do these things, to do these miraculous events. This is in verse 13. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. So they're ready now to start killing animals and performing sacrifices under the Jupiter, basically, and, 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 uh, and unto Paul and, and Barnabas, because they're thinking that they're gods walking around in the flesh. And that is in verse 14, when they, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes. It means they tore their clothes. They ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? They're saying, look, you don't understand what we're talking about here. You don't get it. He says, we also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all that are therein. This is the true repentance that they're looking for. See, they're saying... These people, they believed in a false gospel. They believed in a false religion. They believed in these gods, these, these Roman gods. And Paul's saying, look, turn from their, their vanities. They're meaningless. They're nothing. You know, they, they don't exist. These false gods. They say you got to turn from, from believing in that and turn to the one true God, the living God, the God that actually made heaven, the God that made the earth, the God that made everything. 
There's one God. He created all. There's not gods. These are just vanities. They're made up. You need to turn to the real God. The one true God is what he's trying to express to them. And again, turning from these vanities unto the living God. This is not just talking about turning from their wicked, sinful lives. He's talking about turning from worshiping these false gods. Because I'll tell you what, you cannot... Get saved. You cannot put all of your faith in God. You cannot put all of your faith in Christ if you're still believing some other false religion. A Muslim can't be believing in Muhammad and Allah at the same time as believing in God and Jesus Christ. You, you just can't have that. God demands all of your faith to be on Him. You can't have these, these other false religions. People say, oh yes, you will. Is it in the, and they'll play these word games with these. Repent of your sins card. I can't say that. You know, I've been bringing it up a lot lately, but because it's, it's so prevalent out there today, and they try to twist your words around, and they'll say, oh, well, well, isn't worshiping a, a false god, isn't that a sin? And you say, yeah, that's a sin. Well, if they have to turn and, and, and stop worshiping their false gods in order to be saved, then they have to turn from their sin to be saved. And see, so they play these little semantic word games with you, and they'll try to make it sound like you're saying, oh, you have to turn from your sins to be saved. But see, they'll point out the one thing that you actually do have to turn from because it involves your faith, whatever you're believing in. If I was believing in this bottle of water to get me saved and get me to heaven, or if this is what I was trusting in as God, I can't be believing on this and believing on Jesus Christ to get saved. I have to say, you know what? You're just a bottle of water. I'm putting my faith in Christ. I mean, whatever it is, if it's, if, it's, if it's the Buddha, if it's a Buddhism religion, if it's a Zen religion, whatever it is, whatever you're trusting in as being the truth, as being, the, the, as being God, if it's not the God of the Bible, if it's not the Lord Jesus Christ, hey, you can't be believing in this. You have to put all your faith in Christ. It's a real simple concept, but these people try to twist your words around and say, oh yeah, well see, you believe you have to repent of your sins too. It's like, no, I don't. Because first of all, if you're going to say it's, it's a sin, then that would be repent of your sin, not sins. These people say you got to, and, and they, know, they know what they're doing. They know what they believe. They know that they believe you have to turn from, from drinking alcohol and smoking cigarettes and doing all these other things in order to be saved. But what they do is they play these stupid word games, and this is the one true repentance that you would need to get saved, is if you're believing in some false god, if you're believing in some false religion, you have to change that. You change your mind of what you're putting your faith in, and you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's real simple. I don't know how people get this so backwards, but this is what we see here exactly in chapter 15 when it says, Turn from their vanities, turn from those idols, turn from their false gods, and turn unto God and believe on Him, because He's the one true God that made everything. In verse 16 it says, Who in times past suffered all nations to walk, in their own ways. This reminds me, it's going to be coming up in a few weeks, but in Acts chapter 17, it says, for as much then, in verse 29, Acts 17, 29 says, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to, re to repent. Excuse me, so there we see that word repent again. And it's basically, he's dealing with the same exact thing. That's when he's preaching on Mars Hill. And there's these people, you know, they're believing in their false gods. The same exact scenario, just in a different city. And, and it says, the times of these ignorance God winked at, which is very similar to, to in verse 16 here, it says, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. So it's saying, look, God allowed this to happen. He suffered it to happen. You all had your fake gods, you know, and, and he basically just allowed this stuff to happen you know, the times this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to, to repent. See, now they're being sent out everywhere and telling people, look, forsake these false gods, get rid of them, turn to the one true God. This is what happened. This is, was the change that happened in this time where, where there's commanded to go out everywhere and, and tell everyone, look, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, so this is what was happening in Acts 17. We'll cover that a lot more in depth when we get there in a few weeks. But um, <clears throat> but I just wanted to point that out because they're very similar here in Acts chapter 14. But let's continue on reading here. It says in verse 17, Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. 
So it's saying in verse 16, he in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness. So he's saying basically, you know, he allowed this stuff to happen. And, you know, in these nations where they're worshiping and serving false gods, you know, he, he suffered it. Men have free will, and he was allowing it to happen. He didn't just wipe them out, but he's saying, you know, he, he allowed it to happen. But it says, nevertheless, he left not himself without witness. And there still wasn't, it's not like there wasn't a witness of God. And the reason why there's no witnesses is in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. He said just the fact that we were still receiving rain and that you're getting food and you're being fed and you have all these good things that happen to you, that alone is, is a witness unto God and how good he is and, and who he is. And that also reminds me of Romans chapter 1, um, basically saying the same thing. Romans 1.19 says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So it's basically saying, look, we're all without excuse. We can understand the creation can understand the creator. We can understand, limitedly at least, we can understand his eternal power and we can even understand his Godhead just by the creation. It says they're clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. And basically, we're without excuse. You can look around today. You can look around at nature. You can look around at the way things work. You can look at the rain. It provides us with our food and all this stuff. And you can understand that God is real, that God exists. And that's what he's saying here in, in Acts 14. The same thing in Romans 1. We're without excuse. And in Romans 6, or Romans, Acts 14... It says that um, he left himself, he didn't leave himself without witness. God left himself, he had a witness. People understand, look, God is real, God's there. <clears throat> Let's continue reading. It says in verse 18, and with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. So here we are in the story, they, they finally just persuaded them not to do sacrifices. They think that the gods came down. They saw this man get healed. They're thinking it's Jupiter, it's Mercury. They came down. They're among us. They plead with them and just say, look, we're men. We're men like you. Don't do this. You know, there's one true God. They tell them about God. They say, look, he made heaven, earth, everything. Turn from these vanities. Turn from these false gods. It's Jupiter, Mercury. It's not who the real God is. There's a real God. He created the whole world. Turn unto him. And they finally persuade them just not to do the sacrifices Look at verse number 19, and it says, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people. Again, who came? Certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Now, this is interesting because they had already preached. If you look at where they, where they came from, it says in verse 19 that the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Now, this Antioch is a different Antioch than where they were originally sent out of. This Antioch is referring back to, if you turn to uh, Acts 13, where we read last week, it says in verse 14 of Acts 13, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. It's a different Antioch. And went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of their city. This is verse 50. We jumped out because in, 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 in Acts 13, 14, they, they come into Antioch. They preach. Again, they're, they're, they're preaching in the synagogues. They're getting a lot of results. But then in verse 50, it says, But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. So in Antioch, they get kicked out. They get this persecution, the Jews rouse up the people, they rouse up the rulers, they rouse up the devout and honorable women and the chief men, and they bring persecution and say, you guys got to get out of there, they get kicked out. That's Antioch. Iconium, we saw earlier in, in Acts 14, right at the beginning, they were in Iconium, it says in verse 5, and when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of, Jew, of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia. So this is where, you know, they're seeing multitudes saved, right? The very beginning of the chapter, they're in Iconium. All of a sudden, they hear about this plan. 
to, to stone them and to kill them, so they leave. So they, they flee out of Antioch, they flee out of Iconium, now they're somewhere completely different, and they hate them so much. These Jews have such a mission to go and just stop the mouths of Barnabas and Saul. They're persecuting so much that they're following from city to city, and I can't help but wonder... You know, the Bible says that that, that, which, you know, that which we reap, we shall also sow. And, and I know I didn't quote that right. Think about Paul when he was Saul, before he got saved. He went around from city to city persecuting the church. He wasn't content just to, to persecute the church where he was at, you know, in Tarsus. He didn't just stay there. No, he had this zeal to go out and start persecuting Christians all over the place. And he was going out and doing this. Now, to me, it's kind of interesting that the tables have turned. Now he's the one getting persecuted. Now he's the one getting followed from city to city. And if you notice here, too, it says um, they stoned Paul. It doesn't say anything about Barnabas. They stoned Paul. Paul and Barnabas were both preaching. They were both getting people saved. Obviously, Paul was the main speaker. He was a chief speaker. I mean, even these people recognize it. That's why they called him Mercurius. But they stoned Paul. Now, everything, all the sins that we've done in our life, all the things that we've done that are wrong, I believe, you know, God can be merciful, but, but ultimately we're going to end up reaping what we've sown. Okay? But don't let that discourage you. Because I, and I still, I hope and pray that this would happen to me for, all, for the things that I haven't reaped yet, that I've done in my youth, the things that I, the, the wickedness that I've sown, if it's going to come back to me, if it's going to come back hard, I pray that it can be used for the glory of God now instead of just, just because I was going to get it anyways. And see, Paul gets a lot of, of, of I mean, ultimately God gets the glory, right? But, but he's giving God that glory through his persecutions and through his sufferings. He could be joyful in this tribulation. So when these things come upon Paul, they, I, I believe that they're tied for what he was doing before. I think it's tied in. But see, now it's being used in a good light. Even though he's, he's pay, he might be paying a punishment for what he did, now he's able to use that paying of the punishment to bring out our glory under God's name and to stand fast and to just show his faith and to prove his faith. Um, and it's amazing. I mean, think about, think about being able to stand up and just getting stoned. I mean, you read, you, it's so easy. Again, I would try not to just read over stuff, when we're, especially when we're going through this preaching, we look at this. Don't read over things. It says they stoned Paul, they drew him out of the city, supposing that he had been dead. Meaning they picked up rocks, a group of people started pelting rocks at Paul. And imagine, put yourself in his place. I mean, I can't imagine that that feels very good. It's, it's, a, it's not a very pleasant way to die. I mean, you'd rather just get shot and have it over with. Getting stoned with stones, I mean, people are pelting you with rocks. That's going to hurt. And it got to the point where, I mean, he must have either, either he really did die, I don't think he did, or he got knocked unconscious and he got to the point where they just thought he was dead. And they just drag him out of the city and just, and just leave him for dead is what happens here. And... When all this stuff happens, Paul does not lose his faith. He stands fast. He stands strong. He stands in the word of God. So they drag him out. They leave him for dead. And I think it's, it's also interesting that the same people, it's because the Jews came from these other places, but what they did was they talked to the people in the city and they, and they, and they were rousing them up. So the same people were thinking that the gods came down to us as men, and they were going to, they were just ready to do sacrifices unto him, that they're so easily persuaded now to kill Paul, the man that they thought was a god in the flesh. Now they bring him out and they stone him, and that just shows how deceitful that these Jews were being, and they were able to just to just manipulate and twist these people and speak lies. <clears throat> so Paul's left for dead. And then it says um, in verse 20, Howbeit as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. So the disciples all standing around him. They, you know, they don't know what to think. They think he's dead. Now either he actually died and God raised him from the dead miraculously, which it doesn't really say that here. And it, it doesn't say that he actually died. It just says that they supposed he had been dead. 
Um, what probably happened is he was knocked unconscious, but I mean, for people to think that you're dead, it still would have had to be pretty bad. I mean, he would have had to look pretty bad, I'm sure. And they just think he's dead. But he gets up, his disciples are standing around him, he gets up, he's able to go back into the city from that they, that they just stoned him from and drug him out of. He goes back in, he recovers for a day, and then, and then they head over to the next place. And I mean, think about the, <laughs> the will that you'd have to have. I mean, you get pelted with rocks, you're not, it's not just a one day thing. You're going to be feeling that for a while. You're going to have some injuries. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be bruised up for quite a while. People throwing rocks at you. Yet Paul was able, you know, I mean, he departed the city and he did what he had to do and he went to Derby. Um, if you're a man, <laughs> use Paul as an example as, as someone you could, you could look at that, that was a man. And don't cry and complain about, about the physical ailments or the little things that you have going on in your life. I mean, we see nothing here about him complaining about getting stoned. Rather, when all these persecutions happen, we see him rejoicing. And these are serious things that happen. Let's continue reading here, though. Look at verse number... Um, well, the Bible says, just, just to point this out, too, Proverbs 24, 16 says, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. You might get knocked down. You might have things happen. I mean, he got pummeled. He got assaulted. And I don't even mean just physically, right? I mean, you can have a lot of defeats in your life. You can have attacks. You get persecutions come, and you feel like you just want to give up. You can feel alone. You can feel, I don't want to deal with this. There's too much strife. There's too much persecution. I just want to, I just want to live a life that's, that's, that's easy, where I don't have to deal with all these things. You might feel like giving up. But the Bible says, look, a just man falls seven times. Be prepared. You fall seven times. But you get back up again. Don't let these defeats, don't let these minor losses, if you could call them that, get you out of the battle. We need to be able to, to pick ourselves back up again. And it might hurt. It might not be easy to do. But we need to just keep moving forward and keep doing what God had for us. God has a plan for Paul. That he wasn't done with it yet. We're going to see he finishes what they were called to do by the Holy Ghost in this chapter. But he wasn't done yet. He didn't even let getting stoned and left for dead, he didn't even let that stop him from finishing God's work. And we all have a calling in our life. You might be going through some hardship. You might, you might experience something, and it might be something that's big. I mean, you might lose a child. You might lose a loved one. You might, you know, who knows? You could be going through whatever it is that's going to bring you down really low. And make you feel like you've just been pummeled with rocks. But you need to pick yourself back up again. And find the strength and, and find the strength in the Lord to keep going and do what he has for you. A just man falls seven times and riseth up again. We need, to, we need to just keep getting back up. God will take care of you. God, God knows what you can go through and what you can't. So let's continue reading. Verse number 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. So they go, he takes a break, he goes to Derby, they preach the gospel, right? But then look what happens. They go right back to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Iconium and Antioch, they were just coming to kill him and, and following him around from place to place. He doesn't let that scare him. He doesn't let that keep him out. Now, he recovered from his wounds and came back, but he came back. And here's the thing, okay, don't let persecution stop you from coming back. Maybe you go out sewing, maybe you go out to the door, and someone just chews you out. And maybe that's never happened to you before. And someone just starts laying into you. And just and just or going after you, or maybe they physically want a confrontation with you. I've never I've never had that happen personally, not yet. I mean, maybe someone swings at you, right? You could say, "Whoa, this is day. I don't I don't want to do this." Don't let that scare you into not going back out soldering again, because because I'll tell you what, that's what God wants you to do, and the devil's gonna do whatever he can to scare you, to make you afraid, to make you think that you can't do this, 
and, and to make you think that the opposition is just overwhelming and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, when you think about these people, they're chasing after him. He's got to think like, man, I can't go anywhere without these people persecuting me. Why can't I just do God's work and, and just be left alone from these people? They won't leave me alone. But he keeps going, and not only does he keep going, he goes right back. He walks right back into those places. He doesn't let that scare him. He doesn't let that count him out. Use this as an encouragement. Think about these stories. Think about this story in Acts chapter 14 when you start going through those problems. If you start having persecution, if you have one of these events happen that really brings you low, it really makes you feel bad, hey, be like Paul. Go back in. Go back into these places. If that's what God has you doing, go right back and do it. Verse number uh, 22 says, confirming, so they go back into Lystra and Iconium and Antioch confirming the souls of the disciples. They go back in there for a good reason. They're confirming the souls of the disciples. They're going back and just making sure they're standing strong. And it says, and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So he explains to them this great truth. They say, look, be strengthened, excuse me, be encouraged. You're going to go through a tribulation. You're going to, through much tribulation, we enter into the kingdom of God. Now, we're almost done, but I want to take a little bit of time here. We're finishing up this chapter and just kind of focus on that word tribulation because the tribulation just means trouble. And a lot of people don't understand this, but all throughout the Bible you see Christians, you see believers going through tribulation and it's something that we can't be ignorant of because if you're ignorant of it, if you think it's not going to happen, you're not going to be grounded, you're not going to be founded enough to be able to stand when it comes. You're going to be tossed to and fro. You're not going to be able to stand strong. But if you know it's going to happen ahead of time, you can prepare yourself and you can strengthen yourself. And you can, when it comes, you can say, ah, yeah, see, I knew this was going to happen. I've been told this was going to happen. You might not know exactly how it's going to happen, but when it comes, you can say, I knew this was going to happen. So it doesn't just completely broadside you and, and knock you down and, and, and knock you out. You can say, well, I knew this was coming. Maybe, you know, I'm as ready as I can be for this. I'm going to keep my faith in God because that's what people have always done that face tribulation. Romans 5, chapter 3, where I'm just going to turn to a few places, not all the places that have tribulation, in, but just a few that are, that are relevant here where he says that we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. Romans 5, verse 3 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience, experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. He says, we glory in tribulations. We're glad it happens. We're glorying in it. Knowing, and the reason why, it's not because it's fun going through it, but that tribulation that you go through, it works patience. Patience is something that you receive. You say, I've been through this before. The more tribulation you go through, the more you can have the patience to get through that so that you don't quit early on. You have the patience to endure, and then the patience brings experience, right? And the more experience you have, the more you know, hey, I've been through this before. It gets easier and easier. You know, it's not as big of a deal when you go through the same things. And then with that experience comes hope. Hey, I've been through this before. I'm still here. I'm still going. It, it gives you even more hope. The more tribulation you go through, you see, hey, look, this is going to end. Even though I'm going through this right now, it's going to end. So these things happen. They, they ultimately will end up strengthening you as long as you don't quit. Don't bail out. It may be hard. It may be difficult to go through whatever it is you're going through, but don't bail out. Don't quit. It'll make you stronger. I mean, that old adage... What doesn't kill you will make you stronger. That's true. You go through these tribulations, it will make you stronger. We can have comfort in tribulation. Romans 8, Romans 8 verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? All these horrible things that can happen. He said, Who can separate us from the love of Christ? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, 
In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No matter what you're going through, nothing can separate you from the love of God, from the love of Christ. Christ loves you. You might think, I'm going through all this hard time. Why? God doesn't love me. Why is he letting me go through all this stuff? Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. You're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing will separate you from that love. He will be loving you. He will love you even though you're going through this stuff. He knows why you're going through You might not understand it at the time. I mean, children might think when they get disciplined or when they get spanked that their parents hate them. No, it's the exact opposite. They love you. They're trying to keep you. They're trying to build character in you. They're trying to teach you right from wrong. Maybe that's what God's doing with you. Maybe it's not. Maybe you're being tried for some other reason, but that you can come through, and when you come through, you come through like gold. <coughs> Be tried. Be tried in that furnace of fire and come out like gold. We don't always have to know what the reasons are, but we can take comfort in that scripture that, that nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. Even when you're going through that, you don't have to question God's love for you. Don't doubt. Continue to have faith. God, Christ loves you. He loves you like a son. He loves you like a daughter. If you're, if you're born of God, you are his child. And, and, and if you have children, you understand that love. At least a little bit. <laughs> you know, our human understanding does, does not even match to, to God's love for us. But, um, but you get a little bit of that understanding when you have your own children and you, and you feel that love for them, that, that, that unconditional love where you just, I mean, you're always going to love them no matter what they're going through. Hey, your love is always going to be there with that, with that child. And it's the same way with God. 2 Corinthians 1 says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. You might go through a lot of tribulation, a lot of persecution, a lot of things could happen, but Jesus Christ is there to comfort you. And don't forget that, don't lose sight of that. You might not be able to realize it, even at the time, you might not be able to think about it, but, but just remember and know that God's word is true, and he's there to comfort you, and he's there for you. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3 says, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. We're appointed unto afflictions. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know you need to get it settled that, that tribulation will come. If you decide to live a godly, righteous life, if you decide to live according to the Bible and do the things that God has laid out for us to do, be assured. Because, because there's God-haters, there's people out there that hate the truth being preached. And if you're going to be a preacher of righteousness, if you're going to be a preacher of the truth, the persecution will come. The devil hates it, and the haters of God hate it, and a lot of people hate the truth. That's why they killed the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they persecuted Paul and Barnabas and all the other disciples and everybody else that went out trying to preach the truth. They all got persecuted. They all went through hard times. It'll come and it'll happen to you, but don't let that move you. You know right now. You know from this sermon right now that it's going to happen. Don't let it move you when it does happen. Don't let that shake you or be troubled in mind. You know what's going to happen. Let's continue. Let's finish off this chapter real quick. There's not very much left. Uh, so verse 22, they were confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. So he's, he's giving them his exhortation and telling them, look, through much tribulation, you need, we're going to enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 23, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So basically what was happening here is that that Paul and Barnabas were going out, they were, <clears throat> first they were preaching the gospel and they were getting people saved, right? Well, now when you have all these people getting saved, there's churches forming. But 
I mean, you're just starting to get these, these believers being together. And so Paul and Barnabas ordained elders in every church because they need to have a pastor. They need to have an elder to, to, to operate the church. And, um, and that's what they did. So they started ordaining elders. They fasted. They prayed. And, and I bet they probably laid their hands on them because that's the biblical way, even though it doesn't say specifically that they did that. It says that they prayed and fasted. And, um, and we see in many other passages that that's, that's how they, you ordain an elder. They ordain these pastors. And it says, and after, uh, and after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, verse 25. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down into Italia, and then sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. So now they've come full circle. You remember, they were in Antioch. They were there. There was all these great men. They were preaching. They were doing all this good stuff, this great work in Antioch. And then the Holy Ghost calls them out. He says, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have, for the ministry of the work. God calls them, they answer the call, they go, they suffer persecution, they have a hard time, but they have a lot of great victories, they have some defeats, they go out, they do this great work for God, they come full circle, they finally reach back to Antioch, and it says they fulfilled the work that they were committed to by the grace of God. And, uh, now, they fulfilled that specific calling, but their life isn't over yet. And here's the thing. You might enter different chapters of your life. You might have different callings from God to do different kinds of work. Don't think when you finish one that you're just done. <laughs> and then you're done serving God. They say, hey, cool, I finished, I'm done. And now I'm just going to take it easy. Because that's not, that's not what these guys did at all. God has more work for you to do. I mean, hey, you finished this task that he set out for you to do? That's not your only one. Just like, just like at work, you know, you get a project, you know, I have a program or I get some, some big project to work on. When I finish that project, I'm not, it's not like I don't have a job anymore. It's not like I just can sit and, and do nothing because I finished my project. No, it's, hey, my boss says, I got another project for you to work on. Work on this. And in fact, he's got projects lined up for me all stacked up so that there is no, you know, in between time. And, you know, it's going to be the same with God. God's got work for you to do till the day that you die. Anybody that's still breathing air today, if you're saved, even if you're not saved, God's got a plan for everybody. And God wants you to continue to work. Um, thank God that they, they were able to complete what they had for them and move on to the next thing. And then it says... Um, in verse 27, and when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how we had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. So they finally come back, they tell them all the stories, they tell them everything that happened and, um, and how, how much God was working in the lives of the Gentiles. And this is big for them because, again, those Jews, it, it, was, it was something new to them. They, they didn't, you know, at first they didn't quite get it. And there's been a, there's a lot of questioning throughout the book of Acts, like, hey, wait, what are you doing going to the Gentiles? Hey, what are you doing, you know, preaching unto them? And what are you doing doing all this stuff? And, and over and over again, they just see it just keeps saying, God's doing this great work. God's doing this great work. God calls them out to do this work. And, and they're doing it. So it's, it's, um, it's really just, just um, solidifying, strengthening that, that doctrine, that understanding that, hey, this is what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be bringing the, God, the gospel to the Gentiles. God's obviously in it. Um, it's not something that's just made up. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your word. God, I pray that you would please help us to have the boldness that Paul and Barnabas had to be able to go into these cities and go from city to city and be chased and be persecuted, but still be able to stand boldly and to resist and to just um, to preach your word, not to back down, not to be defeated, not to, even when, when bad things happen, dear Lord, they just pick themselves up, brush themselves off, and keep on moving, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us have the same strength, the same spirit. Lord, help us never to forget that you're with us, that you love us, and that nothing can separate us from your love. We're saved, we're sealed, we're sanctified unto you, dear Lord. And um, I pray that you would please just help us never to forget that no matter what we're going through, dear Lord. We know that if we're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, that we shall suffer persecution. We know it's going to come. Help us 
to, to just by knowing this be able to stand in that day. And um, having done all to stand, dear Lord, I, I pray that you would please continue to bless this church, build this church, dear God, fill us with, with like-minded believers, and, um, and Lord, we're, we're completely trusting on you to do this work. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.